Well, a very good morning and welcome to South Berlin Baptist Church and this, our online service. I am so pleased that you have taken this opportunity to join with us, whether or not you've been with us for a long time, whether you're part of the church family, or whether this is your very first time. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you are so welcome. I'd like us to think about how we can be so blessed when we turn to God, when we give him our hearts and allow him to go to work in our lives in wonderful ways. And our first song of worship picks up on that theme. Come, now is the time to worship. Now is the time to give your heart.
Well, that song speaks of a time when everybody will see God truly for who he is and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But between now, today and that time, we really hope and pray that many, many people will come to know the love of God in their lives in a profound way. Sadly, so many people have known God, been connected to him and have walked away. But it's a wondrous thing when they are able to come back to the open, loving arms of God. And of course, that was the subject of the greatest story ever told, told by Jesus, the prodigal son. And although we're not going to look at that today, it is mentioned in the message that our guest speaker, Gavin Calver, is going to be bringing to us. So I thought it would be good to remind ourselves of the immensity of God's love through this story of the prodigal son, told here in a way that I think you're going to like. Stories of the Bible, the prodigal son. This is Jesus, Hey-o. who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He healed many people from their sickness, performed many miracles like calming storms, and even raised people from the dead. Jesus taught everyone about God's love. All kinds of people would come to hear Jesus speak, including tax collectors and people who made bad choices. This made the Pharisees and Jewish leaders mad. Ah, yuck. They didn't think that Jesus should be around these kind of people. So Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, Um, excuse me? I want my share of your estate now, before you die. Okay. So his father agreed and gave his son his inheritance. A woohoo! A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings. See ya! And moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. Aw, man! And he began to starve. Hey, you! He convinced a local farmer to hire him. Thank you! And the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the food he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Finally, he said to himself, at home even the servants have food enough to spare, and here I'm dying of hunger. I know. I will go home to my father and apologize and ask him to take me on as a servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. Sir! His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. All right, yeah! Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. Huh? Hey, you! And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. Woohoo! All right! Party time! All right! Yahoo! The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. Oh, man! But he replied, 
All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after wasting your money, you celebrate by giving him a great feast. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Well, it is a wonderful reminder, isn't it, of just how much God loves us, loves to envelop us in his loving arms. And there are so many people in our world, in our nation, in our community, indeed in our own homes and in our church family, who need to know God's loving, God's loving arms around them at this time. And so I'd like to pray now for those who really need to know God's love in their lives. Let's pray together. Loving God, you came to our world through Christ to help, to heal, to save. And now we pray for all those in any kind of need. Reach out to them in your love. We pray for the sick and suffering, the poor and hungry, the oppressed and exploited, the lonely and unloved, the aged and infirm, the frightened and anxious, the sorrowful and the bereaved the helpless and the hopeless. Reach out to them in your love. Loving God, there is so much need around us in our neighbourhood, our town, our country, our world. So many people crying out for help. Reach out to them in your love. Show us where and how we can respond. Give us the means, the will, the commitment and the love to reach out to others in the name of Jesus Christ offering something of ourselves to others, even as he offered his all for us. Father, we do pray that you would hear this prayer, and we particularly today pray that your great love and your loving arms would envelop Susan D as she prepares for major, major surgery. May she know your love, easing her anxiety, and sustaining her as she makes this journey. And I pray that that same powerful love and your loving arms would surround uh, Jeff and Pauline C at this time. Might they know your love in such a profound way that it will just shine light into their sense of uncertainty and inevitable anxiety. Grant Susan D, Jeff and Pauline C, and all those whom we know and love, grant them your grace, peace and love at this time. Reach out now to them in your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, may God hear our prayers. And we continue to think about the enormity of God's love as we sing our next worship song, Here is love, vast as the ocean. And immediately after this, our guest speaker for today, Gavin Calver of the Evangelical Alliance, is going to be bringing us today's message. But now, here is love. Here is love, vast as the old.
the CEO of the Evangelical Alliance. And what a season we've been in. What a time in this nation. We never saw this coming. Anyone that answered the question in 2015, where do you see yourself in five years' time? You got the answer wrong, as I would have got the answer wrong too. But I wonder if you've got a Bible to hand. You might want to turn it on or open it. We're going to go to 1 Samuel 14. And I'm just going to read verses 6 to 13. It says, Jonathan said to his young armor-bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armour bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, come on then. We will cross over toward them and let them see us. If they say to us, Wait there until we come to you. We will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up, because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines. The Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind them. You know, I really believe in this season, it's time for a new move from the church. It's time for us to to step out and step up and be who is needed in this moment. In the passage, Saul stays under a tree whilst his son begins to move. The Lord's calling us to rise, to move into a new day. The world writes one story, the Lord writes another. And this morning, I've just got four quick things for you that I think are so important in this season if we want to step into the opportunities and the possibilities. And the first is this, we need courage. We need courage. Verse 8 says, come on then. We will cross over toward them and let them see us. You know, when I read the Bible, I I used to work for Youth for Christ for 14 years. I've got a passion for young people. And when I read the Bible, I ask the question many young people ask. Not what does it say, what does it look like? You know, we live in a visual age. And often I think about scripture, I think when Moses saw the sea split, what did it look like? What if there was a big fish? Did that split too? And how muddy was the ground? I wish I'd known. Or when Lot's wife turns around and becomes a pillar of salt. Why salt, not pepper? I've always wondered that. Or or when Elijah goes up to heaven and there's whirlwinds and there's chariots and there's fire. And all Elisha's left with is a second-hand coat. What did it look like for him to walk back down the hill to see 50 prophets waiting to say, "Uh, can't split a river like Elijah could? Or what about when Jesus is resurrected from the dead? In the Gospel of John, we see that when Jesus is resurrected from the dead, the very first thing he does, he starts folding up dirty washing. There's two sheets that he was buried in and he rises from the dead. He folds one up. Clearly Mary and Joseph raised him really well. Then at some point he thinks, hang on, I'm the saviour of the world. I need to get out there with my message. Leaves the other sheet unfolded. What does it look like? The Bible is so visual. Anyone who says the Bible is boring hasn't read it. The Bible is the most visually compelling book you could ever come across. But in this passage, what does it look like? There's Saul and 600 men. 
They've basically got garden forks. They've basically got something you would do to, to work the land in their hands. On the other side, there's hundreds of thousands of heavily armed Philistines with chariots. What an incredible moment, one side against another, no chance for one side, it would seem. And you know, in the end, it's not 600 against the Philistines, it's just two. And Jonathan knew his dad would try to stop him. He knew the army would try to talk him out of it. So he listened to the voice of God, not the voice of the crowd. And in this season, we need to listen to the voice of God over the voice of the masses to be courageous and to step out with him. You know, what's incredible too is Jonathan's courageous faith stands out in such stark contrast to Saul's paralysis. And I think for some of us, it's time for us some courage and to believe God can do stuff, to be courageous enough to do stuff, even when it feels foolish. I remember the first time I preached into my iPhone, believing this was a bit crazy a few months ago. And I preached into my iPhone and it was a gospel message. So I did a gospel response. And when I was doing it, I thought, what am I doing? This is crazy. I'm asking people to come to Jesus and I'm just talking to my phone. But I felt the Lord say to me, no, do it. Do it as if you were in the room. So I gave it some. Then when it went out, there was a wife watching this on her television. And her husband wasn't a Christian. He'd been mocking her faith for some 20 years. He had no interest. But he was sat next to her on the sofa because they're in the lounge together. And at the end of my talk, I gave an opportunity for people to pray a prayer of commitment with me. And she realizes her husband's praying the prayer. He's surrendering his life to Jesus as if from nowhere he's giving his life to the Lord. She begins to properly cry as her husband prays this prayer. She contacts me the next day. And you're just like, isn't this amazing? You see, when we're courageous enough to go out on a limb with the Lord, doing stuff that can even seem foolish, whether that is taking on an army or in my small world, doing gospel asks into a phone. When we're courageous, the Lord is with us and he can do wonderful things in and through us. You see, where's Jonathan's confidence? That's the key to the whole passage. His confidence is in the Lord. Where is your confidence right now? He can be brave no matter what the odds, because Jonathan's confidence was in the Lord. Some of what we look at feels impossible. Right now, this is hard, and we look out on our nation, and we think, where are the opportunities for sharing hope? But right now, the God of the impossible wants to give us greater courage, give us greater impetus to make a difference in this moment. You know, I'm a huge football fan. I I like to think that I support the same football team as Jesus. That's probably not true, but I support AFC Wimbledon. Why does Jesus love Wimbledon? He loves the marginalised, those mistreated and those forced to live in exile. But you know, I, I love football and I love Premier League football. And I was reading a fascinating article in a newspaper the other week that basically said that it's the courageous footballers that make the biggest difference. It's the footballers that are brave enough to go for stuff when it seems impossible that make the biggest difference. The the other thing about those footballers, they lose the ball more than anyone else. The two footballers that lost the ball the most in the Premier League last season were Trent Alexander-Arnold and Kevin De Bruyne. The player of the year last year, Kevin De Bruyne. Young player of the year, Trent Alexander-Arnold. You see, with these footballers, they're courageous enough to try stuff others wouldn't try. And it doesn't always work, but they go out on a limb and they try it, and it works more often than it doesn't. You know, for us in the Lord, perhaps we need to be courageous. Perhaps we need to be bolder. Perhaps we need to take more risks and go out on a limb in this season to make a difference and show those around us what does it look like to stand on the rock of ages while there's shifting sands going on around? What does it look like to know that, like, Jonathan, our confidence is in the Lord no matter what we are facing. We need to be courageous. But secondly, the Lord's calling us to greater togetherness. In verse 7, it says this Go ahead. His armor bearer is saying this to him Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan's armor bearer goes with him into enemy territory. He trusts him, he's totally committed to him, he's got his back. Who's got your back? Whose back have you got? What I love in scripture, there's loads of moments just like this one, where all it takes for someone to do something incredibly brave and incredibly out there for the Lord is someone else to say, yeah, yeah, seems like a good idea. I'll come with you. I'll have a go. I've got your back. We need to be together. We need to be journeying together. We need to be going along with others was listening to a talk from the Australian church leader who's based in New York, John Tyson, in which he said, do not just surround yourself with those who agree with you. Surround yourself with those who are hungry for what you're hungry for. 
So I guess the challenge is, what are you hungry for? I am hungry to see a revival in the United Kingdom. I am hungry to see the the nation turned inside out, upside down and back to front for Jesus. I'm hungry to see thousands, millions of people on this small island of ours surrendering their life to Jesus. And I am blessed to journey with others who want to see that too because we're not supposed to journey alone. I think the Lord, though, is calling us to a greater depth of relationship going forward. Real relationships that don't just say we're a church family, but live like we're flesh and blood. Real relationships committed to one another, dependent on one another, journeying together. John Wesley was riding along on his horse one day, and another guy pulls up next to him on another horse. He says to Wesley, Sir, you want to serve God and go to heaven. Remember, you can never get there alone. You must either find companions or make them for the Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. You know, there should be no such thing as a lonely Christian. There should be no such thing as an isolated Christian. If we are isolated, the enemy can take us out too easily. We need to be together. Who's got your back? Whose back have you got? We as the church in this season can do something that the world can't do. We can have unity across ethnic divides. We can have unity across generations. We don't need to pitch people against one another. We can stand together as we make courageous moves. So courage, togetherness. Thirdly, faith. Faith. The second half of verse 6 is this. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by a few. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. You know, now is the time for faith to take new ground. Now is a time where the enemy might look huge. The enemy might look so big we could feel like we'll never win. But it's a time for faith. The church is called to rise up in faith and trust. How is your faith at the moment? You know, this has been a really hard time. I don't want to underplay in any way how difficult a time this has been for all the opportunities of this season. There's so much pain. And for so many of us, it's had an impact on our faith. For many church leaders, they're exhausted. For many people working in the marketplace, they don't know what to do. For many people are learning to homeschool and other things. It's been really hard. But perhaps for some of us, we need to remind ourselves it was hard for Jesus too. And in this season... Maybe we also need to remember, if he can save Jonathan and his armor bearer in the face of that army, he can get us through this coronavirus pandemic. He can save you. He's longing to save others through you. He wants to take new ground in and through each one of us. But it's a season where, even though it's hard, even though we can feel like we're being challenged from every side, we are not destroyed and we keep going and we rise up in faith for what's possible. The Lord can do so much with so little. That's throughout the Bible, from my favourite story with the feeding of the 5,000, through to moments like this. You see that Jonathan and his armour bearer can take on a huge army. What the Lord can do with so little is profound. The thinker Edmund Burke said, nobody made a greater mistake than the person who did nothing because they thought they could only do a little. In this season, we need to start realising our little in the hands of Jesus goes an awful long way. Perhaps it's time as well for hope to come back. Hope about the prodigals we've given up on. Hope for our neighbours. You know, in this season, your street has become your parish, your garden fence, your pulpit. And maybe we need hope again to pray for so many to come to the Lord. Evangelicals overestimate their activities and underestimate their prayers. Maybe we need to raise our prayer life in this season, praying for many to come to Jesus, to realise that in the midst of the despair, hope is a name and his name is Jesus. And they too can have a personal relationship with that living Jesus you know what's interesting too the UK has been living with something called mortality salience mortality salience is an awareness of your own fragility it's normally saved for war zones when you live in a war zone you you sort of realize that you might die so you start asking questions of life the big questions in this season the United Kingdom is living in what's like a war zone that we're sat on our sofas not in a trench And there's a mortality salience that says, I could be affected by this, I could die. So people start asking questions like, is there a God? Where's hope? That's why things like the Alpha Course and Christianity Explored are exploding. The Alpha Course had none online in February. They've now got 1,600 because people are asking questions. I've got a friend who stuck 25 Bibles on their drive during lockdown with a note saying, only take one if you'll read it. All 25 went. And inside was a phone number about a WhatsApp group you could join. 
Over 20 people have been in that WhatsApp group on an online Bible study every week ever since. This is a moment for faith. This is a moment for courage. This is a moment for togetherness. And finally, this is a moment for action. The second half of verse 12 says this. Climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Faith without deeds is dead. We can't just speak. We have to act. We can't just watch on while in despair with what's going on in the world. We step out into the world as salt and light, but the salt must have its flavor. The light mustn't run out of battery. We step out and we act. Where is the Holy Spirit prompting you to take action? Who is the Spirit leading you to? Where are the opportunities? Where are the openings? What new space are you called to take? You know, I really believe we're living in a season of suddenlies. You'll notice this, won't you? You make plans for three weeks' time and suddenly you can't. In the same way, some of us need to go slower. Some of us need to go slow and stay low with people. Some of us need to notice what's in front of us. We're living in a season of suddenlies. I keep having moments where suddenly my day changes and, and that's often as the result of an interaction with another person. We need to be aware of these suddenlies and step into them and be hope to people. There's new ground being given to us quickly and we mustn't just live on yesterday's story. If the spiritual temperature has changed, if the cultural narrative has changed, if people are living with mortality salience, then we mustn't live on yesterday's expectation that those around us aren't interested in our faith, that those around us will reject us. Actually, those around us are crying out to hear something of the living Jesus in this moment and we must act and speak out and live out into that context. You know, um, I've been going to the same barber for four years. And every time I go in, I try to talk to him about Jesus. I think if I'm paying him to cut my hair and I've got a captive audience, I'll have a go. But you know, he's not usually that interested. He's not that bothered. He wants to talk about some conspiracy theory or political agenda or something else. But I went in three weeks ago. And I went in through the door and he says to me straight away, I am so glad you're here. I'm desperate to talk about God. I was like, whoa, what's happened here? Tell you what's happened here. He's lived through a time that has questioned everything he thought he could depend on and it's all been found wanting. And so in the middle of that, he's thought, who do I know who stands on something else? Who do I know who lives by something different? And he thought of me. Why? Because he knows that I put my faith not in the United Kingdom, not in the government, not in the stock market, certainly not in the football scores, but I put my faith in the living Lord Jesus. And by the end of our time together, I've given him the link to sign up for an online alpha that he's now going to do. You know what? Hope is a name. His name is Jesus. And I'm hoping he meets him. This is a new season. We need courage. We need togetherness. We need faith and we need action. This is a time of opposition and challenge, but it's also a time of great opportunity for the church to stand out, speak out and live out. It's a time to move courageously, move together, to have faith and to put it into action by the power of the Spirit. We haven't had a day like this before. We will not have this day again. Let's not moan about what we don't have. Let's step into the opportunities we do. And let's arise, O church, with a bold new move. Because this opportunity is in front of us to be courageous, to go together, to have real faith for our nation and to act, sharing the love of Jesus with those around us. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, I thank you so much that anywhere we go, you are already there. I thank you for your great promise that you are with us. And I just pray for everyone watching this that they would know you with them, that they would know you leading them, that they would know that they don't need to be courageous without you, they can be courageous with you. I thank you, Lord, that that it's not just you as well. Others go with us. There's no such thing as a lonely Christian. Help us to have the backs of others and for others to have our backs. I pray, Lord, you would raise our faith as to what is possible. Give us new hope for those we've given up on. Help us to pray for those that we're desperate to meet you. And Lord, help us then to act, stepping out, speaking out, and living out for you. Lord, we love you. We are desperate for this nation to be one for you. Use us where you will. Bless us, we pray, and anoint us as we seek to serve you, showing those around us what it means to follow Jesus in the midst of this pandemic. Amen. God bless you, and go for it. Oh, mm-hmm.
that we would be a people of tremendous courage and tremendous faith, reaching out in love to all those who need to know you, the living God. So help us to do that. Be our vision, be our guide, be our strength. This day and on into the future, we ask it in Jesus' name. Thank you so much again for taking the time to join with us online. I hope to see you next week. Until then, please continue to stay safe and may God bless you.